five years ago, many things in my life just kind of collapsed in on themselves all at once. That was the best thing to ever happen to me because uh, those 10 years, I had people patting me on the back saying I was doing a good job. Oh, you did that album cover. I love Kid Cudi and things like that. And it built a protective cocoon. In actuality, I had basically sidelined every component of what like makes you human, how to be a friend, how to be in a relationship, how to be an artist. In that collapse and the attempt to rebuild, I basically am, you know, sitting there <laughs> as, as an adult man being like, okay, I did it wrong the first time. What does trying again look like? GM, GM, and welcome back to the NFT Now podcast. I'm Matt Medved, and today's guest is Sam Spratt, a New York-based artist who has emerged as one of the most acclaimed and highest-selling creators in the NFT space. His Lucy series of digital paintings paired with written psalms has generated millions in primary sales, with six-figure sales at major auction houses like Christie's. He recently announced The Monument Game, which will launch today and represents the next chapter of his artistic journey. Very excited to dive in and learn more about what that's all about. Sam will be showcasing with us at the Gateway Korea in Seoul from September 7th to 8th. Our two-day activation with FactBlock will include immersive audiovisual gallery of leading digital artists and fireside chats, keynote speakers, and more. If you'll be out there, we'd love for you to join us. Request an invite at nftnow.com slash gateway dash Korea. Without any further ado, let's get into it with Sam Spratt. Sam Spratt on the NFT Now podcast. How are you doing, man? It's great to have you. Good to be here, man. I'm doing very well. We're in the final stretch before uh, almost a year of my life <laughs> finally comes out. So feeling both the uh, pressure and the deep excitement to share it with everyone. And I know that feeling from like when we launched the Now Pass, it's like this anticipation, like it's it's somewhat nervousness, it's somewhat excitement. It's like, it's just, it's bringing something to fruition that you've been working on for a long time, I, I imagine. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a necessary act is these moments where you uh, retreat and build and exert. And through that tear, you grow. I love that. Well, let's get into it. Um, why don't we start at the beginning? Just how did you get into art and how did you find your way into uh, the NFT space and Web3? For sure. So I, going all the way back, I followed a girl to art school who wanted to become a fashion designer. Uh, our relationship did not make it past the summer before college began. But I showed up in art school and I had never really been a, uh, I would say, a good student. Uh, but when tasked, not so much with uh, history or math, but uh, drawing something in front of me, uh, I really, really fell in love with it. I, I found a deep adoration for seeing this world around us uh, that looks like a bunch of very solid things as uh, forms refracted through light, just bouncing everywhere that is making things feel uh, as they are. Um, and that strange extra layer of art, which is uh, what happens when it's not all exactly what it's supposed to be or what it seems. Uh, right out of school, my very first gig was being a staffed illustrator for a tech blog. So I was making about $20 in illustration, uh, doing editorial cartoons, basically. And through that process, uh, it was early days at this stage for social media. And so I would put a little tag at the bottom of every article, artwork by Sam Spratt, check out my portfolio. Here's my Facebook and Twitter back when I was using those Facebook. Uh, and through that process, I started getting clients and I found, you know, this $20 jobs turned into $500 jobs, a couple thousand dollars here or there. 
And then they started rolling into like legitimate album covers and movie posters, working on games like Red Dead 2. And uh, I think this 10 year arc of, uh, I guess, a commercial art career uh, unfolded. And it was both, uh, I would say, a successful one. Like, I, you know, paid the bills, um, felt supported, honed my craft along the way. Uh, but it was also, I think, a very interesting 10 year period because. I had spent 10 years being a professional artist, essentially creating other people's worlds. And in, in that process, I was inadvertently uh, being a bit of a coward, uh, being, being a bit of a sucker. I, I was uh, purely labor for someone else. And, and you know what? I, I needed to do that to like earn my stripes, to get what I like the skills that I needed. But I also like let myself down in the sense that I had nothing to say. And about five years ago, uh, many things in my life just kind of collapsed in on themselves all at once. And that was the best thing to ever happen to me because uh, those 10 years, I had people patting me on the back saying I was doing a good job. Oh, you did that album cover. I love Kit Cudi and things like that. And it, built a protective cocoon or bubble or ego around me where I could feel like I was doing something remotely right. But in actuality, I had basically sidelined every component of what like makes you human to create that client list and work on those jobs. And everything else that is life, I had totally missed, just top to bottom how to be a friend, how to be in a relationship, how to be an artist. So in that collapse and the attempt to rebuild, uh, I basically am, you know, sitting there (laughs) as, as an adult man being like, okay, well, I did it wrong the first time. What does trying again look like? And art felt to me like a very tangible first step. I could make these tangible markers, these paintings of those feelings of trying to stitch it back together, of trying to make uh, your steps forward in life to like try again. Okay, well, what kind of time do I need to exert in to my friendships and my family to make these things real? If I'm going to be an artist, how do I chase something other than money or clients? Uh, if I am going to be in a relationship, how do I give my all to it? Like my, my whole self, nothing held back. And Lucy is that story. Like L- L- Lucy is charting the course because for me, I felt like, man, it would have been nice if someone let me know all the steps before like some state of enlightenment, like all the ugly gross kind of sad and over earnest steps of clawing your way back into something and trying again many people have done that mind you this is this is not like no one's done this it's just i wasn't paying attention and so lucy is very much the story of well we have life what do we do with it in order to do something with it you got to start paying attention i love that um, who is Lucy? Tell me, tell me where, where the, where did this inspiration come from? Um, and, and, uh, you know, what was that kind of like moment of Genesis? For- yeah, I think Lucy, Lucy was born from that feeling that I'm expressing, starting over, you know, like it, it, when everything kind of went to shit, it wasn't like, um, okay, now I'm, trying again just as like another human i felt like i was truly like i missed every step that every human throughout history has built and left behind for this very reason (laughs) so so uh it it is lucy you know in a way is is um it's it's a joke on myself like everyone is um laughing at my attempt like I, 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 
missing it so bad, but also at uh, need, needing to extract it in this way to try to understand it. Lucy as a name is pulling from our Australopithecus afarensis relative, Lucy, found in Afar in Ethiopia, and uh, as well as a couple other inspirations that I think uh, the more lore heads of Lucy have stitched together. And as far as who it is, I, I see like Lucy as much as it's born from like my personal experiences, for sure. Uh, it's like a, it's more of a refracted self-portrait. Like every painting I'm making, every kind of feeling I'm trying to express in any of these things is not just like explicitly, uh, you know, some like autobiographical thing. It, it's way more, what are things that many people are missing? Like that, that we are oddly all stumbling into this. And strangely, crypto NFT is the space I feel has attracted a lot of people who missed something. Uh, wh whether they have succeeded or failed on like monetary metrics kind of doesn't even matter. There are many people here who have done phenomenally well in their life and they have missed basic tenets of humanity that they are finding here. And, and they're finding it among like brethren who also missed it and are like, hey, I stayed inside my room for the last 30 years being a gamer and a gambler uh what does friendship look like <laughs> so i i think it's the the primary driver here is make something that is my whole self nothing nothing held back you're you're getting all of me and lucy but it's not just there to be some kind of like emotional vomit it's there because when I see that in other people, like that is the thing that is the primary motivator to keep going of, all right, I, you, we don't need to like just stay in sad sack mode of everything we missed forever. Get up, go, build, make something, find your tribe, find people, stitch it together, make something bigger, stretch, grow, tear. Like this space is good for that. There's a feeling of decay in whatever we were up to before it that here even for all of its faults and all of its problems there is i think a profound driver to see and create whatever the future holds i love that i love, love, love the way you put that um talk us through the early days of the lucy project like when did you start creating art uh featuring lucy and when did you start minting uh art featuring lucy yeah, so in late 2020, I had just done an album cover for Kid Cudi, and I got that like sweet, sweet dopamine hit of like doing an album cover that a lot of people see because you know your friends like text you, like I see it on Spotify. But I've been doing that for 10 years, and so I watched that kind of like dopamine hit drain very quickly. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit, <laughs> okay, I've done it again. I'm back here. I, I'm I'm looping. <laughs> I'm doing the same thing again. So. I decided to take a feeling in my life and I made a painting called Slip Space. And if you look at it next to that cutty cover, you can like feel the color similarities enormously. They are very much like made in that same moment. But it was the first personal piece. This is before I had done any NFTs or anything like that, that I had made in a very long time. That's, that's how like lost and abstracted I was from being an artist. I like wasn't even making things for myself anymore. So I made that. And I enjoyed that process so much that I was like, all right, I just need to shut all this down. So I literally just like stopped taking clients. And I was like, I need to tell a story. I need to make something. And my, my first inception of it was not Lucy. It, it wasn't that eight figure. Um, but it eventually found its way back there because that was not it, but it was the closest I ever got to this is from me. This is my, my thing, my world, my universe. And around the same time, I was discovering the space. I saw all these artists, Beeple, Fibo, you name it. And, you know, it's just a bunch of people who had no filter. Like there was no middle management, no agency, no label, no studio in between them and their output. They were 
the creator. And it really only required one person to align with them, to collect them, to say, this works, keep going. So I spent about 10 months just studying, lurking, following all, everyone, you included, right? You know, your classic punk back there. It's like, a, you know, you, you, you guys are all these little characters that um, I was getting acquainted with and I was far too shy to like speak up in a space or, in, you know, inject myself in anything. But one of the things while I was creating this, those first three paintings, Birth of Lucy, Lullabies for Isaac, and First Sacrifice, which would constitute Lucy chapter one, one of the things I noticed in my 10 months of studying the space was that there was this source, which was the artist, and a destination, which was a collector. But there was this whole story that would take place in the auctions, and no one was doing anything with that. The, it was just gone. And that's how art has always been. That's how auctions have always been. They just are gone. And the other thing I noticed was that people were airdropping a bunch of things to people for free. Many of these things either people didn't want, uh, people didn't actively choose to get, um, and, or just forgot about. It, there was no intentionality in it. So in creating those first three pieces, I also created a structure where I said, I created this blueprint skull, this, this primary central skull of Lucy. And however many bidders there are in these auctions, unique bidders on the ledger, I'm going to make a unique skull, a derivative of this for each of you. So I don't, I didn't know how many bidders there would end up being. I didn't, know if this would kind of go very far at all um but the intent behind that was this moment in my life i was trying to do my own thing like i was trying to like get out of a cyclical pattern that i had been in for uh, over a decade and any energy that someone could stack every offer that stacked and multiplied into each other if they gave me that well a thank you right like gratitude is good it's a good place to start but i think that like gratitude is more powerful when you return it in a way that only you know how to do and so for me that was painting that's like that's all kind of all i got <laughs> Miss, missed everything else painting okay so i got all that the auctions end up getting rather heated and interesting we got a lot of very high level collectors like barad and kazomo in there and it was both an amazing start to the, actually the story of Lucy, but it also planted all of these seeds for the skulls. So I created these 50 skulls of Lucy. And uh, about six months later, once I finished creating all of these derivatives, I created a claim portal with the protocol engineer who I worked with at SuperAir at the time named Zach. And the intent of the claim portal was to avoid that airdrop. It was, you did this. It means a lot to me. It is written in code on chain that it mattered, that I can always look back at the timestamp and these names that went into each other. And I can remember the exact feeling of a very, very important moment in my life. But like, this isn't your life. You're probably going to forget about it. It won't matter. That much. And that's okay. But here, if we agree to do a digital handshake, I made this claim portal. I spent six months making these things. You claim it. I give this back to you. You gave me a, you basically paid gas fees, right? You, you bid, maybe pay a couple hundred bucks in gas at the time. I now give you a painting back. And at the same time, I did the auction for the blueprint skull. When all of that went down, I, Initially, honestly, thought I like kind of failed. Like those first auctions were very way beyond my expectations, and the blueprint what what went for a, a great price, but there was no like secondary trading of these skulls or anything like that. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I, I think the intent to thank people that was inescapable. That was just the primary motivator. And so if these things around this space and this world don't value that, okay, but you know what? I did it, I meant it, 
I felt it good. Keep going with the story. And so I was working on chapter two. And shortly after I released chapter two, and that sold to 6529, um, another, that was an all time high sale at the time for me. Uh, a guy named Benny, who you know, bought the first skull for 6.9 years. And what I realized now in the aftermath of that first purchase is this is what happens when you pay attention because all the ingredients were there. The skulls of Lucy were not like a, a botched job. Like it's just my time scale was way off and it requires people who did, who look really closely at things to see what makes something slightly different than anything else. And follow those currents, like go down that rabbit hole. And what has unfurled in the last year since with the skulls of Lucy has been a beautiful thing to witness. Like it, it, it like, it's like this profound honor to have just incredible human beings all over the space that cover every kind of guy you could really have here. And I'll put a little chip in my corner, just like, I like this, keep going. And the story that has unfolded on top of that has been, I think, one of my biggest joys because it's showed me that art may begin in the imagery, but I think those days are numbered and it actually, what is unfurling and that the blockchain in particular and that act of gratitude was the first thing to jostle this loose in me is that art needs to be communal and participatory in some way. And all of those ingredients is what has now a year after that led me to the monument game. I love that. Um, it was a really great explanation. Before we get into the monument game, let's talk about the Council of Lucy, which is the the the, the group of of those collectors, like you said, that that do hold the skulls. Like, what exactly is that council? How does it work? Um, and you know, kind of setting the stage for the monument game. So, I created the council earlier this year as an experiment. I wanted to see. All right, I have this group of people. It's a small, tight little group of 50. This isn't like a 10K project. This is something that you know, only a few dozen people have. How do I bring them closer to me and closer to each other? And I wanted to try to do that in a way that was not community, like uh, the proverbial community. Um, without utility or an airdrop or anything like that. Um, despite its appearances, I wasn't even really attempting to make a cult. Uh, but what the council was created for was that layer of art that I am exploring right now, that communal layer, this story that exists, that begins in the image, but actually unfolds with the participation and the people around it, that the act of collection is not actually just transactional. It is the beginning of an actual bond that if nurtured and strengthened and brought deeper into it, can actually do something kind of crazy. That, that there's a gravity that can form around this that not just like links me to each of these people, but starts linking them to each other. And the very first, I guess, initiation I had was bringing them all into my home here. And so everyone during NFT NYC uh, earlier this year came into my home, same place. I got married to my wife, Rachel, you know, uh, and I shared with them this project and I, I showed them what I was trying to do. And I asked them, uh, hey, I don't have any free thing for you. I actually want something from you. I would like to give you a responsibility and be woven into my art. This will require some of your time. It will require your judgment. But if you're open to it, I'd like to try something out. And that is what the council is. That is its entire driving purpose is 
I want as my life as an artist, as Lucy grows and evolves, that every single person that connects to me in some way that tries to help me, I want to try to create systems where they touch this, that it's like real, that like I, <laughs> I'm making this right now. Like I'm spending all of my time and effort. This is all my focus is that if you come into it at all, come because you are curious about seeing that grow and any connection you can form within it. Everything else, bullshit. I can give you no promise. I can give you no anything. This is purely if you are like, I see this thing. I want to help it keep going. And what I've gotten out of that has been amazing because the people who collect these things are smart as hell. There's a lot of very intelligent people who are approaching life from very different angles. And so all those blind spots that I have for missing so much in my life, I now have like this incredible group of people who I can go to and ask for, for advice and guidance to test my ideas up against things and never just have one voice that is guiding, but have a dialogue and a discourse. Uh, a, what I try to live my life by is the idea of mental sparring. It's like everything gets better if you fight it out. I love that. I love that. So now that we've got the, the Council of, of Lucy, what is the monument game? And what role does, does everything we've discussed uh, play in this next chapter? So I've been planting all the seeds that are necessary for the monument game to exist since Lucy began. So this is seeds that pertain to the story the lore, the codes, but also the market structure, right? This is the actual like real world things that have unfurled since Lucy started. And the monument game centers around these four main pillars. The first is a painting and it is the most intricate painting I've ever created by like a very, very wide margin. And it is something that I have I, I've never poured more love, time, attention, uh, push what I know about art and image making to try to create this. And in making that, one of the things I realized was, what is even the point of that if you can't digest it? Like if you just scroll past it on Twitter, why even make a thing like that? You know, it's one thing to go through a museum and you see a big, sprawling, uh, you know, dense work, and you can sit in front of it and you can kind of consume it. But how do you make that digitally? And for me, that, that required essentially building our own platform. So I went out and I met with a bunch of developers. And one of the developers I met with was Duncan Cockbuster of Nifty Gateway. And I pitched this to him and I said, I have this idea. It would basically require you guys to like make a totally different site and just take it over. Any interest? And so I explained, I got this painting, pillar one. Pillar two is a game. It's a viewer. It's a way to go close to the painting, to zoom and pan around it, to get close to these 20,000 pixels worth of painting and find something in it from the hundreds of stories that I've woven throughout it. And the third pillar is my first edition to work, which serves as the ticket to enter this one of one and leave an observation of what you find. Now, the goal of those first three pillars was how do I create a work of art that I'm truly proud of, that I poured all of my love and time into. How do I widen a circle with a new group of people, but also have their very first interaction with this, be at something that only a few can collect, right? That, that isn't for everyone. And have their first time in this be one where they're not just clicking a button. They're not just transacting. They're not just here to flip, but try to create a game and a system that actually disincentivizes that 
almost entirely and makes your very first entry into Lucy as one that demands something of you. Like it requires you to give a piece of yourself to it. So to ask this of people, I, I think is a lot, right? To ask someone not just to like pay me money to buy my art, but also to come in and give me their time and thought and attention is, I think, something some would do. But this connects to those market structures that I was talking about before of, well, what if you just meet people where they're at? What is a game without something on the other side, a reward, something for playing well? So the fourth and final pillar is the skulls of Lucy. It's the council. So that one of one is the object of attention, right? It's like the fire at the center of it. The skulls of Lucy and the council are the people all sitting around the fire. They are the ones that are swapping stories. They are the community centered around it. And now this outer rung of players can get closer to the fire if they play the game well. To do that, the council is going to be gathering around, taking all of these 256 observations once the game closes, and they're going to deliberate on them. This is their responsibility, to give a vote, to take some time out of their day, their lives, to go through and reach consensus on which three players were the most observant. And those three players will win a Skull of Lucy and a seat on the council because I kept three and they are now going out. So the aim of these systems of the one of one, the Skulls of Lucy and now the players is how do, I, how do you have these rungs? And it's not just like, okay, now here's something, but it's for more people. How do you actually deepen the bonds and links between all of them? And the Monument Game was first and foremost built to share something I love about art, which is look closely at things. Like you can find something to love if you go infinitely into anything. If you're paying attention, good things happen, always. How do you make a game that reinforces that concept? You need the carrot at the end of the stick. You need to not like look at this market and just be like, oh, I'm only here for the art and the holistic spiritual side of it you you have to recognize that all of that is born through the transfer of energy that is flowing through many people connecting to a common network and believing a common thing and kind of fighting with each other to create movement it's really powerful uh, I've been no I've seen obviously the um, the players being selected, uh, you know, on on social media and and this participatory element that's also kind of like widening the the scope of of involvement with with your community. Um, like, how is that? How has um, that uh, that reception been? And and has it been playing out sort of like the way that you'd envisioned it? Yeah. So as I mentioned, I gave the council a couple of responsibilities. So one was the vote, but the first was actually to give me a name. And it was, I basically tasked them with, give me someone you believe in or who believed in you, someone who you want to support or see do well in this community. And of these 256 editions, we will set one aside for them so that they can play the game. And this is someone that you champion, but ultimately I wanted to try to give the council a responsibility that basically put them in the shoes of someone that was giving to someone else. Like here's an addition. Here's the, this is, you know, 3.33 ETH worth of, uh, worth of art and a ticket to play this project. And I was honestly like unsure how all of them would take it. Like I, I wasn't sure if they would, want to like wait why can't i keep it why can't i play but every single one of these people on the council understands a they can't win the game b they can't even vote for their own champion that they've nominated and c that champion who they've selected has almost universally been 
someone that they just think is great. And, and it, it, this has been, I would say over half of them have been artists in the space. Uh, some of them have been collectors, builders, engineers. We've got a few people who are outside the space who are coming into it uh, through this. People who are, as I said, like there's this layer of story in Lucy that is unfolding outside of the imagery and within that council. So the, the responsibility of giving each of them this uh, ticket to give to someone else is essentially to say, well, what's your story? Like connect me to someone that matters to you. Uh, and I think through that process, I've, I've learned amazing little like histories between each of them. Some of them have been like their mentors. Uh, some of them like colleagues who are in the trenches with them in the early days, uh, or just like artists they support and believe in. It can really be that simple. There's even a few who really had a, a tough time even picking because they're not that deeply woven into the space. And they just gave them to artists that they like, but have never actually even spoken to. So like there was a range of people, even some were uh, like Cyborg Nomad, who actually collected the blueprint skull. He gave two of his, he, he has two skulls, so he had two tickets to give away. He gave his to just uh, Mello and 787, uh, two guys who he just knew because they had been following along with Lucy for a long time. They had like decoded a lot of the lore. They were like way down underneath. They, he knew that they would play it well, right? And it wasn't like they're playing it well for him. He doesn't get the spoils of this, right? And I think watching that unfold in this like strange network casino where so many of the decisions get made are extractive has been, I think, uh, a very encouraging sign that, like, you know, you just build the kind of thing that promotes the kind of behavior that you believe in. People want to do that. But if, like, what you build is just things that feed all of our worst impulses and degeneracies, well, people will do that, too. Because we're human, we we got vices, we got greed, avarice, we got all these things, and and you know what, you set us up for it, man. We'll go there. Uh, there there's no one uh, that I think is like too good for that. But I think if you build something that is um, at least systematically created with opportunities to give, I think people will absolutely do that too. Because people contain multitudes; they are both things. Yeah, well said, well said. So obviously this podcast is releasing on the 17th. So take us there, the 17th. Like what, what, what's going on with the Monument Game? Uh, how can people get involved? What do people need to know? And what are the next steps? Uh, Nif on Nifty Gateway is going to be basically a site that you've never seen before. We are taking it over for a week with the Monument Game. When you go to this page, what you'll see is you will see this giant painting and you will be able to enter it and go inside of it and look around it. And you will be able to place a marker uh, to leave an observation and you will need to buy a ticket in order to leave the observation. But anyone can view it. Anyone can look around and see what other people are conversing. All of these things are coming in in real time. So not only can you leave your observation mapped with the coordinates uh, on the painting, but you can also compete with each other, converse with each other on top of it. And so what that serves is you'll see this toggleable, almost heat map of observations that people have left that is like a digital varnish on top of a digital painting. It is a communal layer of the artwork that unfolds on top of it. And from August 21st to August 24th, that one of one that everyone is observing on top of the monument game will be on auction uh, and it will be on auction within Nifty Gateway, but on a manifold contract. So it is actually a manifold auction fully on chain that is taking place within the walled garden of Nifty. And then the tickets will be able to be purchased on Nifty Gateway. There are 256 of them. Uh, obviously the players that have been selected as well as PTM who through a Christie's auction, uh, collected the first 
and only allow a spot uh, for, I believe it was 19 and a half ETH or so. And he will actually be the one that enters the game first. So he'll be leaving the very first observation before anyone can enter. Then the auction begins, everyone can leave their observation. And for four days, this thing runs. So you have four days to leave your observation and you don't have an NFT yet. By buying a ticket, you have purely secured your observation. It's like an ammo counter. You bought one, you have one shot, then you let it fire. Um, and you may do that out of the gate, you may hold it, but it's gotta be during that window. At the 24th, when this auction for the monument game closes, the game closes too. And all of those tickets are minted with their observations that were left atop them, written into the metadata, the trait data and description of each. And Nifty has also built an entirely new sep secondary market just for the monument game as well, where you'll be able to go through and read all the observations. With the auction close, the game ended. Now these editions are minted. So these 256 are now in the hands of people. And that's where the council starts deliberating. So for the next week and a half or so, the council will be going through two rounds of voting where the first, they will be placing a vote on one observation each that they view as the most impactful. This will curate down in theory to a list of around 40 some odd uh, finalists. And then we will publish those finalists noted with a mask sticker stamp uh, atop all of the observations left within the monument game. And then they will be doing the final vote in unison uh, re to reach consensus. During that period of time of deliberations in the secondary market, what is valuable to me is the observation left. So if you have written down, if you have given a piece of yourself to this project and you've, you've shared some unique variable that only you have, some part of your life that is reflected and refracted through the art, that's what I'm looking for. That's what the council is looking for. And so to win the monument game, you not only need to leave that observation as voted on by the council, but you also need to hold on to it, right? So if you don't believe in yourself enough during those deliberations and you try to sell or flip your edition, you may make your profit or whatever. You do, do as you please. That is entirely up to you. But the downside is you have also, in the event that is the winning ticket, you have also sold away your seat on the council and the skull of Lucy that comes with it. So it's the game, the structure, the incentive is, okay, you come in and you collect this thing, but you can't sell it yet. And in fact, your entire incentive structure is, all right, you bought it, you have an addition of mine, but to make this thing the most valuable it could possibly be, you actually have to now give it your time and your thought and your attention. And if you don't do those things, that, that you, you have the freedom to do that. That is entirely your call. But the, in, the game, the incentive structure has been put in place to promote that. And then in the aftermath of it, it now, instead of, all right, now I've got this thing, who can I sell this thing to? It is, how competitive are you? Like, how much did you really get in there? Are you, are you gunning for this? And to me, I, I love treating art, observation, life as a competition. A friendly one, mind you, but I think that we get stronger when we are pushed, where it's not all wag me, where that energy is, get the fuck out of here. I, I, I want people to run run like wolves with each other. I want them to like nip at each other's heels and attempt to come out ahead. Like there's something beautiful found in that process. It's, it's what I enjoy most about art is like doing that against myself, finding other artists that are so inspiring and creative and letting the, what they've output into the world, their extractions, like feed me and fire me up to 
go further in and see what else I'm capable of. So within the boundaries of the monument game, it is my, my grandest hope that people play, but people play well and they play to win. Love that breakdown. Super, super insightful. And uh, look, I, th- I think you've just like stepping back, you know, kind of like zooming out a little bit. Like, I think you've just done, Sam, like a really great job of of like utilizing the dynamics and the incentives and the opportunities that are created by this technology to like really build artistry and like these uh, and like like a vision for artistry that 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 couldn't really have been done prior to to using this technology right like you couldn't really set up a game like this necessarily prior to like um you know like this this kind of like digital ownership revolution and and you have really built community which is often often used buzzword but you've actually built real community around your artistry and like and this project um by leveraging that technology and so i'm curious like how do you sort of think about this technology as like uh, a new creative canvas or like a, or, or a new creative tool or a way for you to bring some of these dynamics and uh, ideas to life? So the Monument Game was born because I was in Milan and I went to see The Last Supper. And I don't know if you've seen it in person yet. It's, it's a really special experience because it's a painting everyone knows. It is meme to death. It is not it almost feels like unspecial, despite how famous it is. But then you go and you see it, and it's pretty much the only thing there. It is a very confrontational experience. It's all you're looking at. And I was deeply curious, how do you do that digitally? Like, I, I find myself, I don't know if you find yourself here, but like so much of what I feel like I butt against, what feels wrong and the 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 inverse trajectory of humanity is that things are just sliding right off us. Everything is smooth. There is nothing that is sticky. The content made, the art made, like it's just slipping right past you. Even if you like it, the moment you like it, you forget about it. And so for me, making something just so great that everyone just automatically is like, this is sticky is like, I don't think it works like that anymore. I, I think that these technologies, these network effects of digital signatures creating points of contact that are conduits across the entire system, they just need human bonds that actually link them. There is an actual human behind all of those, uh, everything on the ledger. But how do you like make something like uh, connective, emotional in some way between that? And so the monument game is something that you can't really do at a gallery, right? Like when you go to a gallery, a museum, like you go and you see a painting and like that could be an incredible experience. Like these things are unique and fascinating, but like the digital medium, um, it, 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 it almost like can't do that. It can't immerse you in that unless you do the thing that the digital medium has been quite good at, which is you participate in it, you interact with it. And it's here that I think I broke my brain in the process because I think I realized that this is what art is going towards. This is what I care most about. Like I have been making imagery almost my entire life. Like I'm a painter. It is a very brutal realization to realize that imagery is basically done. Not done like it doesn't matter or that no one can love it or or anything like that, but done in the sense that it has been pushed to whatever it can be pushed to. And now we have to see how many other layers under and above it can be created. I think that this moment in time, there are stories that need to be told and the way that they're being retold in say film uh, or tv are sliding right off of us they are smooth experience the lessons that we need to have passed down are uh, they're just not sticky they they don't hold any occupancy in our mind and i think that's because for better or worse like 
humanity has connected itself to each other in a marketplace. And I think that if you see that marketplace, not as this gross evil thing, but as something that can make someone feel the story, participate in it, both feel like the win of it or the loss of it, like the, to, to be actually in it is a very different feeling. Like I was doing art for 10 years prior to this. I would make commissions, checks, royalties from those things. The moment I made my first sale in Ethereum, that was the first time in my entire life I ever owned something that fluctuated ever, right? I, I was not a financially literate person. I didn't have any stocks or anything like that. Watching that rhythm, that like ebb and flow, that oscillation of like a massive group of people that sometimes it feels like there's coherence to it. There's like a, a natural tendency to it. Then there's also people trying to like game it, trying to make it do things to psych people out, to, to pump it up or to short it. And then also seeing like the enemies of it try to destroy it and the allies of it try to bolster it. And this like global war of sorts unfurling on top of you know, a little diamond symbol of that is East. It really just changes like how you take everything else in. And so I decided wherever I want to take my art, it does like, just cause it's a still image doesn't mean the next step is okay. Now I should make it move or now it's in 3d or now it's AI or now it's handmade or whatever. Like I, I don't think any of that really matters. I, I think that all of those things will, be subsumed to the same destiny, which is we are heading towards an ever escalating participatory society. And there are, there is every mechanism in place in that technological boom to atomize yourself and become a ever more lonely, ever more isolated human being. But that in here, if you're paying attention to it, is a like profound opportunity to get out of your cave, like stop being alone, connect yourself to the network, and try to contribute something to it that only you know how to. I think that this canvas is filled with insane opportunities. The Monument Game is really my first experiment in it, but all of the seeds that I have planted so far that are present in the monument game, all of the seeds of where I want to head next are present in the monument game as well. Amazing. Amazing. Well, when I, when I told Benny that we were chatting, uh, I, I asked him if he had any, any questions for you and he sent me quite a list. I, I've, I've selected two that I think uh, uh, will, will make the cut here, but um, uh, delivered courtesy of Benny Redbeard. Uh, tell us the importance of circles. This is a great question. Uh, I think I have a great family and I have three brothers, a uh, mom and a dad, and uh, they're, we're all wildly different people. We, like, we, we have maybe a few common personality traits, but like could not be more different. Doctor, rabbi, engineer, artist. That's, that's my brother's. But within that unit, I have been able to like witness what it is to be strong and weak simultaneously within a unit and to be loved in your strengths and your weaknesses simultaneously. In marrying my wife, Rachel, uh, same thing, but deeper, even more profound of sharing strengths and weaknesses filling each other's gaps, looking where the other is not, helping each other through this world. These circles of real human relationships that begin with family, partners, and then extend out to friends. Uh, I mean, this is how you survive, but this is also how you like learn and, and grow. And so if, if you don't, structure what you put out into the world as something that 
follows that pattern, that fractal, that design, I think you are missing it. Like it, everything is a concentric circle. It just is. It's as it can be as hacky of an observation as humanly possible. It doesn't matter. Like whether you want it to be true or not, there is a code that everything follows. Whatever religion you believe in, whatever your ideology is, it doesn't matter. There's something true. We're all pointed roughly at it. And it circles. I love that. I love that. Uh, I might select another one, actually. Um, he, he also asked, what's the significance of a paper brown bag? So connecting to uh, the, the origin story there of my first assignment in art school, uh, when I showed up there was uh, my first day of class. We were sat down in front of a large wooden plinth with a bunch of brown paper bags crumpled on top of it. And we were tasked with drawing them with pencil. And uh, I had never drawn a still life really. And this was a very frightening prospect because many of the other kids in art school uh, had way more experience than me, had received more classical training than I had. Um, so I felt a little out of my depth, but, uh, as we're sitting there, the teacher is just rattling off in the, in the background, like the voice of God, uh, you know, this, this brown paper bag, this, this item might look so simple, so, so mundane, but look at how the light outside of the window is dappling in on it and casting subtle shadows across it. Look at how it's bouncing across that wall and off the plinth itself and up into the shadows, this cracks and grooves and creases. Everything in front of you, light is showing you what it is. And that very mundane, uh, you know, lunch bag object was ultimately, I think, this, the single like biggest catalyst for um, why I have been fixated on pushing my craft uh, as an artist, as a painter, why I am obsessed with classicism, like some of the values that are there in great masterworks that are uh, further away or more abstracted now that I see like value in pulling bits of that into the future, that there, there are like very real um, and powerful lessons in the paper bag, but also in the school of thought that led an art school teacher to try to convey such a simple concept in that manner to some students. I love that. that that's very powerful. Um, you know what? We're going to, we'll, we'll do two more of these. We'll do this instead of bullish or bearish. We'll scrap the, we'll scrap the rapid just, fire. Just Benny. Um, <laughs> just Benny. But ben, Benny's just going to become a recurring segment on the, on the NFT podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> shout out benny uh, who Gosh. does a lot for this space um uh indeed uh how do we as as a human race get out of the muck i think the way you get out of the muck is that person that you maybe at one point believed you were and maybe have lost sight of along the way but maybe in the back of your mind like you still have some delusion into thinking like i could be that one day if you don't attempt that you will stay in the muck like you will forever be a what if a potential and the act of getting out of this is releasing fear it's releasing bullshit it's releasing your stories it's releasing your lies it's releasing as much as you possibly humanly can to just take one step towards this idea of yourself that you think you're capable of being. And I think pretty much any form of distress that we, we hold on to the, the shit people like to lop into mental health or what have you, is just a byproduct of not being what you know you're capable of being. It's just it, 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 their names and labels, uh, conditions that are bootstrapped and, uh, placed atop you or into you as a result of not being what you know you're capable of. And it's a very brutal and hard process 
to even head there. But I think that it's like the only point of doing any of this is at least to try. And like, especially to try and then fucking fail miserably and then have to do it even harder again. I think that's where that's where movement happens. Final question of the of the Benny segment. Um, and this was the one that he marked as the most important. How has uh, your wife, Rachel, changed your life? A great question. I view Rachel as the like perfect woman. She she is like she is many many men date girls, many women date boys. Rachel is a woman and she has helped profoundly take that fire, that flame, that thing inside me that I have let almost my whole life be just clouded in the most nonsensical cosmic dread and ennui and angst and emotional artist, whatever, and just say, this is, this is including all the ugly parts of it, the most beautiful thing that she's ever seen grow. I'm going to do everything I can to help you. And I, I am going to put all back into you to take the stiff, destructive nature that is man and make a dance, make a move, keep going. And she has, yeah. She is everything to me. I love that. I love that. I mean, you, you two seem to be an incredible team. So very powerful words. It's a, it is a byproduct of seeing her strengths and holding them with as much value as she sees mine. And that's it. Like, it's, it's just that. Everyone's got different, a different sauce uh, to contribute. And I think uh, most of the worst bits that ever occur in our friendships or relationships or business partnerships is when, uh, you know, we, we take for granted others contributions, uh, that we see only wanting to see ourselves mirrored back in us that like narcissism of relationships in all capacities is damn. <laughs> and I, I say this having, done that a few too many times to be comfortable with you and me both uh, and and amen to that um really beautiful well sam um as we move towards a close um i know we are also very excited to have you exhibiting work with us at uh, the gateway korea in seoul this september um would love to just hear a little bit about um about that what what you're going to be showing and um if you have any thoughts on korea or the asian market for web3 yeah so i Part of Monument Game is the ticket, the edition, which is player. Uh, so there's an edition of 256. So that would be player one, player two, player three, and so on. And that's the piece that I'll be putting up in Korea. And it is uh, a, a, it's a Monument Game it is the most zoomed out, complex, dense, intricate, world building filled painting. Uh, player is a uh, very intimate and personal piece uh, that connects on top of it. And so I wanted very much for the first edition work I did to, I create to feel very much in step with everything else I've made. Something that is, has just as much time and attention and love put into it. Um, but that I think signals what it is to like take that, thing that used to only be for a few people and share it. And I guess if I had to like connect this any way to what you guys are trying to do there is I think we are, we are all very curious about whether we have all stumbled into the exact group of people that will always be here. And that is it. That this cast of characters is filled. The roster is done. This was a beautiful time in life. We all had fun. We all uh, experienced some wins and some pain, but that this technology may outlive it, but that whatever this current iteration of it is, 
it stays within this zone. And I think it only surrenders to being in that zone if no one bothers to try to build things to get it out of it. And so that requires building projects, artwork, platforms that promote the best ideals that have bubbled up in the last few years, but also requires people like you pushing into areas that are ripe for understanding this, that already have all of the ingredients, the love, the appreciation for uh, art, games, creativity, uh, and do it the same way you would in Miami, right? The, the same way you would anywhere else. And so uh, for me, this will be the furthest away I've ever seen my art uh, displayed. So I'm very curious to see whether uh, my uh, angsty pale blue Australopithecus uh what people make of it in in korea but uh i think if life and the space is any indication i think we we share pretty much everything in common and the the country is pretty much irrelevant i love that well we're, we're very excited to have you final question before we wrap just what what else is next uh for sam spratt for for your projects obviously i know you're very focused on the monument game right now um but is there is there anything else you can tell us about the road ahead if you can look at the monument game and see everything that i have laid out in the last two years across this body of work that the game literally would not exist without every step taken to get there just know that that is the way that I think about all of this. I, I view every time someone has collected my art or shared it or passed it on as like the most unbelievable thing to ever happen. It is this huge energy stacked in my direction. And I think the only way that I can really like honor it is if I do something with it. And every time someone does, it gives me a little bit more runway, a little bit more time, a little bit more breathing room to zoom out and think years in advance. So uh, what I'm working on next, uh, I think the monument game, as much as it is chapter five of Lucy, it is very much, I, I think, the beginning of what I'm about to get up to. It is a, a pretty big departure from anything I've created so far. Well, we very much look forward to to seeing uh, it all unfold and uh, and and be realized. Sam, always great chatting with you. Really love this conversation and uh, excited excited for everything to come. Thank you, Matt. Good chatting with you. Look forward to seeing you around. Good luck with Korea. I'm sure this is going to be a insane effort by everyone involved getting that up and running but i hope that when you're there you get to feel that that win and current of it all because it's uh it's you guys pushing like really pushing that was a really powerful conversation and honestly inspirational for anyone who's ever felt like they've hit rock bottom and just goes to show that there is always a better path ahead i loved sam's wisdom his insights and most of all his vision for Lucy and the Monument Game. We're lucky to have Sam in Web3 helping to push this space forward at the intersection of art and technology. If you haven't already, I want to encourage you to sign up for our weekly newsletter at nftnow.com newsletter. Each week, we distill everything happening into the space into actionable insights straight to your inbox, free of charge. Thank you again for tuning in. We will see you again next week on the NFT Now podcast.